begin by thanking Christina and SDUIS for this opportunity and apologize for the delay in getting things technically set here. Um, what I want to do today is I, I want to, uh, with so many people on and so many of you are so skilled, that I really want to get some dialogue going around uh, the relationships that we form with each other as we work, our, our working relationships. And um, I'm hoping that I can get you to share uh, some of your experiences as well as I, uh, me sharing mine. Um, I want to know in particular, as, as we go through today, I, I want us to take a good look at what's shaped our development uh, as an athlete, as a coach, as a sports psychologist. Um, and, I, and I want to do that, like I said, by looking at, at our relationships. So um, let me remind you of, of where we left off. And I'm going to share my screen here. Let me do this. And do this. Uh, last week, uh, we left off with uh, this picture from the Barcelona Olympics. So let me play it for us and we'll start over again. Oh dear, that didn't work. You know, um, I, I, again, I'll appreciate your comments and your thoughts, but 
I, I think most of us would love to have a relationship like the relationship that you see or we see there between Derek and his father. Um, deeply personal, a relationship where you know that the person loves you, supports you in an unconditional way, no matter what. They're there for you. And, um, you know, it's those kinds of relationships that do provide strength for us and help pick us up when we're, when we're down, uh, when, when we have those kind of relationships. And part of the question that, you know, I want us to be asking ourselves today is, you know, to what extent can you have those kinds of relationships in some of the working relationships that, that we have? Um, I, I guess another way of asking that question is how personal are, are your working relationships? Uh, and let me talk about it now. And I'm talking as a sports psychologist because that's what I was. That's how I've uh, seen myself. But you can think of yourself as an athlete or a coach. And the relationships that get formed, uh, my relationship with a coach, if I'm working with them, or an athlete, whoever it is, uh, they're like contracts. Um, and we build them because we have a common goal. We're, we're, we have an articulated mission, an objective that we want to accomplish. And um, presumably, we both have something of value to, to provide for in, in that relationship, something uh, that unique that, you know, that connects us. Those relationships could be totally businesslike. Um, it could be that, you know, and, and maybe in sometimes in pro sports, they are. I hire you to, to work with the quarterbacks, and that's all you do. And I want you to deliver on that, and that's it, and we're done. This is what your definition is. This is what you're going to do, and this is going to, you know, this is how you do it. Um, and, and so as you, as you think about that and you think about the relationships that you have with people, how, how clearly defined are they in terms of the objectives that you have? Um, you know, I, I put down here at the bottom that, you know, we have uh, team members have a distinct identify and uh, identifiable and mutually agreed upon roles. Um, and when all of the team members have faith or trust and confidence in each other, then, you know, we, we uh, perform our best. We work well together, if you will. But um, how much of that working really depends not just on what you bring technically and tactically to the relationship, but on the personal aspects of the relationship uh, as well. So um, let me just open that up for a question. And, and uh, how personal are your working relationships? How, how important do you see uh, the friendship, the, the knowledge on the part of the other person that you're there for them? How, how much of a role does that play in the relationships that, that you have, the working relationships that you have? Anybody? Dave? Can you hear me, Bob? I can now. Yeah, because I had it on the mute. First of all, I have to make a comment, and I want everybody to hear this too. You talk about relationships, and back in the 70s, you were so instrumental in my evolution of growing within the field. And it was all about relationship, and we didn't have to be close friends, but you were inspirational. And I just want to thank you. It's so good to see you here now. I, I think my I think it's all about relationships. Of course, it's about the work that we do. And I don't think we can have like this really strong relationship with every coach or every athlete. I think that's a misnomer too. But I think what we get out of the work we do is when we have solid relationships with coaches or athletes or our family or you even see what's going on right now, which is a generalization about, um, you know, the racial uh, insensitivity and how we overcome that. It, it's about building relationships that are longstanding based on honesty, authenticity, and trust. So when I think back in the relationships and the people that I really kind of the relationships that resonate, I think this is such an important role of what we do. And the last point, 
I think having what your first question was to us, this connection of, of people we can kind of call on. And I know there are a lot of people here, I don't know everybody here on, on the Zoom, but how we can work with each other in a non-judgmental way to give each other support and strength and, and ask the right questions and give authentic responses. So it's a long-winded response, but I think this is everything that it's what we do. It's about building trust and, and sustaining that trust and connecting on an authentic way and doing a good job of listening. Uh, Dave, I, I couldn't say anything uh, anything better than that, and I'm humbled Dave, by by your uh, your statements about the 70s. Uh, I think without a relationship, it's just a job. You know, it's like I go in, I put in my time, and I leave. But I came into the field, and I work with people because I want more than that. I I do want that that kind of personal relationship. One of those people that, uh, you know, I put a slide up here on the screen of a guy who, uh, for, for me, was one of my idols and role models, Mel Rosen. And, and Mel was the sprint coach at uh, Auburn, and he was uh, an Olympic sprint coach. And um, the quote there that you see, coach, coach Rosen told me that I could count on him to be at the track every day and be by my side. He was true to his word. It didn't matter whether it was practice, a conference meet, international competition, or the Olympics. Coach Rosen was by my side, helping me and the team do our best to win. He didn't just teach us running technique, he taught us life lessons. Harvey Glantz, Olympic gold medalist. And uh, you can see from, from that what Harvey wrote there relative to uh, Mel Rosen, that as Dave said, you know, the relationship was just about everything. And obviously, Mel had to live up to what he promised. So he had to be there at the track. He was. He was true to his word. He could trust him. He believed in it. Mel, uh, you know, and when I look at the working relationships that I've had, uh, you know, across the years, I've always, almost always come away from them feeling like I benefited far more than the people that I was working with. And I remember Mel and I were at the... Uh, Olympics um, and I in uh, 84 and uh, every morning we would go out before the athletes got up and we would walk around the, the uh, USC campus and Mel would tell me everything that went on the day before all of the drama and the trials and all of those kinds of things and my role in that situation was listen um, and basically support in the sense that Mel was probably a better sports psychologist than I was. I know for sure he could use humor to, to break down negative thinking and to, you know, to get athletes to do things. I, I remember him telling me about one of his sprinters, Willie Smith, and, and Willie, uh, Mel was frustrated with Willie because every time they would have a meet, Willie would run to Mel and ask him, who's in the lane? His first question would be, who's in the lane next to me? And then the second question would be, what's their best time? And, and Mel didn't want Willie thinking about that, worrying about that. He wanted him to prepare for his race. It didn't make sense for him to be trying to do that. So one day what he decided to do was Willie came running up to him and said, you know, man, who's, who's, who's in, my, in the lane next to me? And Mel responded with Mrs. Rosen. And Willie, without thinking, said, what's her best time? And it was that kind of interaction that you could have with Mel. I mean, he had great stories to tell. And, and, and a lot of them on Willie, and we'll probably get into some of them. But I guess I'd like some input, again, from some of you who are on here uh, about the relationships that you've had. Um, how, how clearly defined have they been? And, and you know, how have you maintained the, the personal professional boundaries? Dave mentioned that we can't have relationships with everybody that we're involved with. And, you know, we can't be a father, uh, the, the Derek's kind of father to everybody. So how do you set reasonable boundaries? How do you, how do you move in that direction? Any thoughts, anybody?
I think it can, uh, my name is Joseph P. McGrath Jr. and I'm just right outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm an hourly worker, so I've been in the, the industry for a number of years. Um, so it's been a challenge to be hired full time. Um, but I've done my very best to try to, what you've been talking about, which I really appreciate the, the relationships. And I, I feel that's very, very important. Um, it, it, it can be a challenge. Uh, there, there's times that I try my very best, even when uh, there's certain things you disagree among your colleagues, just to, you, you want to keep a good relationship. And, uh, you know, I ask questions and, uh, you know, ask them how they're doing on, on a, a personal note as being, hey, you know, that's how you build a relationship. But I would say it can be challenging now. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Anybody else? You know, um, let, let, me, uh, let me move on here. One of the things that I talked about at the outset relative to these relationships and that kind of stuff is, you know, I found that oftentimes I would get involved in a relationship and um, my understanding of what that re relationship involved wasn't necessarily the same understanding that others had. And I don't know if you've had that experience or not where, and I've asked these questions here about what is sports psychology and what's a sports psychologist because I think if I ask, in fact, let me ask you guys to define that right now. What, what are some of the definitions of a sports psychologist and or sports psychology? How would you tell somebody what it is? Anybody? We can't get a definition for sports psychology? Can you hear me, Bob? Hello? Jim? Yeah, this is me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, Bob, I think for me, it's certainly changed, you know, over the years. Um, and, you know, we've had this sort of discussion for a long time about sort of the, the legal use of the word psychologist and, you know, that sort of thing. And I just think there's just lots of room for all of us at the table. And I think my role has really, really changed. I think over the years, if I've gotten older, you know, certainly I, I, I see a sports psychologist as being a resource. I see them being a friend. Um, I see them being a mentor. You know, one of the things I don't see that's ever changed in my career has been I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan, you know, that, that um, my relationship with the coaches and the athletes is really sort of at the, the locker room field level. And um, I really stay away from the media and uh, kind of that part of it. So I see people's lives as being very private. And I think we even have to work with them to help them understand that because today we just have, I think, so many boundary issues with all of the social media and, um, and, and social networking and that sort of thing. So I have found myself not only, I think, helping me with my boundaries, but helping people with whom I work with, with their boundaries as well in terms of what's, what's private and what's personal versus what's public. Okay, that's great. Jim, anybody else want to add to that? I mean, what's important for me about what Jim said is he's, he's A, he said that his, his uh, role has changed or does change. It's flexible. It's not just a single role. Um, you know, if we, let me go over here. Uh, I remember when uh, I was in graduate school and uh, in fact, I was doing my internship in clinical psychology and one of the tests that we were using was the thematic A perception test, which is a projective technique. And so the picture that I've shown here, at you, what I would ask is I'd show somebody that picture and then I would ask them, can you tell me what was happening um, before this picture was taken? What's happening in the picture and what's going to happen? And presumably that person would project some important aspect of themselves that would tell me about them onto what that person was doing. So I would get some insight through the way they viewed that picture into what drove them, what they were thinking about, that kind of stuff. And I remember the professor at that point in time 
pulling out card 16 on the TAT, which is a blank card, and saying to us, Sports psychologist is you're uh, you're going to paint a picture of who that person is, um, and um, at, at the time I thought he was crazy because what I felt I needed at that point in time was some structure and direction. I want to know that I'm providing and I'm meeting the expectations and I'm doing whatever it is that I'm supposed to do, and the idea that I would be flexible and fluid and that things would change as my working relationships changed uh, was uh, difficult for me at that, at, to, to see at that time. But that's clearly from my perspective what's, what's happened. Um, and, and I guess I'd like to get us to think of, you know, some of the factors that Jim was talking about what his role is, but some of the factors that affect maybe the way we carry out that role. Because I can talk about being a sports psychologist, and in my head, I may have all kinds of views about what that means. It means one thing in this relationship, and it means something else in, a, in another relationship. But what are some of the factors that, that affect uh, the way that uh, you, you fill your role? Imagine for, for a moment if you were the Olympic sprints coach. You're a coach now. Um, and you've been selected to coach the uh, Olympic sprinters. How does that affect your role as a coach? Anybody? How do you think that's going to change maybe the way, let's take Mel Rosen, how is it going to change? How, how is Mel Rosen's role going to change as the Olympic sprints coach versus being Harvey Glantz's coach. Anybody? Um, I can have something to say here. I think it's you have to have the the uh, welfare of everybody on the team. Obviously, uh, you can't be focused on one individual. You have to have the the best interests of the entire team in that situation. Okay, that's a good point. Other thoughts, people? Anybody? I know you guys have had experience. Well, I'll tell you uh, um, a story about what Mel perceived his role to be. Um, when we were at, uh, at the 84 games and uh, we were talking, actually, we were in a training camp in Santa Barbara before the game started. And Mel and I were talking. And uh, he said, you know what's going to determine whether or not we win the gold medal in the sprints in the games? And I said, uh, uh, no, Mel, <laughs> you know, you, you tell me. He said, it's where we're housed. And I said, well, you know, what do you mean? And he said, well, if we're housed at UCLA, my job's going to be easy because the track is about 200 meters away. All I got to do is roll the people out of bed, get them into the lane, the gun goes off, and they're going to win the race. But if we've got to navigate from UCLA all the way across town, it's anybody's guess as to who's going to, who's going to win the race. And so part of what Mel was pointing out to me was that as the Olympic coach, his role was basically to do whatever he could in a supportive way to allow to knock down barriers and allow these athletes to do what they could. But as an Olympic coach, he's working with four sprinters that he's never worked with before. Uh, he's, so he doesn't have a relationship. So the notion of technique and the kinds of things that you might think a coach would do or would be working with weren't appropriate. He would be stepping on personal coaches' boundaries if he did that. And so Mel was smart enough to recognize what his role was as that Olympic coach uh, and adapted to it. 
Uh, yes, he did what you suggested. You know, he was responsive to all of the people on the team. He didn't pick favorites. He didn't try and deal with it. He was as supportive as he could be, but he had to temper uh, part of his identity to fill that role. He had to change. Have you had situations like that yourselves? Yes, no, nobody wants to jump in. All right, we'll move on, guys. You're putting a heavy burden on me here. Uh, I can say something about that. Um, I coached my daughters. And so there I had to sort of step back as a parent and look at them through the lens of just being another member of the, of the team. So, um, yeah, that, that, that was quite difficult in some respects. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. When I, I was a diver, and to maintain my sanity in graduate school, I coached age group diving. Um, I'd get away from my studies and I would go and I would coach age group diving and I would experiment on them psychologically, if you will. But one of the kids that came out for the diving team was my son. And I quickly found that it was much easier for me to turn the coaching responsibilities of my son over to one of the older divers on the team than it was for me to try and coach my son just because I had a tendency to be harder on him and to be uh, for whatever reason than, than maybe I should have been. But it wasn't easy for me to bridge the two roles. Uh, any of the rest of you? Dave. I think the context is so important. If you're bringing up an Olympic coach, the Olympic coach has to be true to themselves, their values and the coaching philosophy but be a selfless servant. And in the description of what you just said, you know, how can I help everybody thrive when I really still don't know everybody, but it's my responsibility in a selfless way. The slide you have up now and what Sheila just shared and what you just shared, you know, recreational sport and what the needs of those athletes and as a coach, what the coach is doing to help them is much different than professional sport, but there still needs to be a relationship established one where the coach isn't taking, like having an ego about it, but it's a matter of how can I help these young kids learn and grow and thrive and embrace competition, whatever level that might be. But there is this core principle is that every coach has to be true to themselves in a selfless manner. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's important. And, and, but let me point out some of the conflicts and let me see if you guys can tell me how you, you manage um, you know, some of, some of those uh, conflicts. We'll take the Olympics coach. And so let's assume that this is the throws coach. And he's in the position, he's gotten this incredible position, he's gotten professional recognition by him being selected as an Olympic coach in the throws. He goes and he's feeling pressure to perform. And his identity is with his skill and ability as a throws coach. So his natural tendency is to want to get in there and see what's going on with the throwers and maybe start offering technical advice and so on at the worst possible time. And so part of what he's got to learn or part of what I had to help them learn was the lesson that I learned from Mel you know, no, this isn't the time for you to do your coaching. It's what you just said, Dave. This is the time for you to just be there in a selfless supporting kind of way, doing everything you can to minimize the potential conflicts and so on that this athlete has. So it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. And I think we as sports psychologists find ourselves in that kind of position too, we, where we feel there are expectations on us to do things when and take the initial maybe we would have just been better off just to listen and be supportive if you would i picked this picture because when my my son was about six playing uh youth soccer i remember the intensity of one of the parents who we happened to invite this couple over for dinner and this parent was saying, you know, what our team of six-year-old soccer players needs is a good intimidator. 
we need somebody who will go out there and whack the kid on the other team to put a little fear in him so that we can win some of these games. So you find yourself in that situation and youth sports is a great place for it where you have a mixture of competitiveness and how, how do you manage those kinds of situations? Can some of you share some of the ways you dealt with, with parents who on the one hand just want their kid to have fun out there and to get playing time and others who want to see their kids go to college on a scholarship or make it into the pros? I know I worked uh, with uh, the YMCA for a number of years, and you, you could see a variation of uh, parents, which I valued and enjoyed working with the youth. Um, I would do like uh, a lot of our sports leagues, and uh, you could see um, you had more appreciation for working with the real little kids, you know, like doing like street hockey, because they just wanted to play. And I appreciate that. I would be the ref. Um, but as you got older, um, you know, our rink was kind of small. And uh, we, we would, uh, you know, as you get older, a lot of the parents, and even, I, I guess, like you're saying, even the, the, the parents would encourage that. And I don't know if they encourage that coming from home or encourage that, hey, you better knock somebody out. And, you know, that's not always, you know, fun for that other child, other parents. Um, you have to bring in medical staff, whatever else. Um, so, you know, I feel everybody should be able to enjoy themselves, get a good experience. If, if um, you know, you want good memories going forward as, hey, I worked with the YMCA or played uh, soccer, football, whatever, but, um, some of the parents can be uh, very competitive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but do the rest of you feel kind of the way I do, that what you find yourself gravitating towards, in other words, do I feel myself more comfortable dealing with the kids who are just out there for recreational play to develop relationships and do those kinds of things? or am I more comfortable in the situation where I'm working with highly intensely competitive individuals? You know, what, what does it say about you and what does it say about the kinds of situations that you should probably end up in? How, how does it help to define who you are as a coach or as a sports psychologist? What have some of you found? What, what have, where have you found yourselves drifting I think with uh, recreational sports, we try to get children that are, aren't, aren't even in a, like the end stage of growing yet, let alone developed mentally to compete like their college students and pros, which is asking something that's very impractical. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you have some coaches that don't realize that or refuse to acknowledge that. And parents are, they're an interesting sort when it comes to rec sports because you can always see that parent that's like, I don't know, I wanna call it the inner crazy coach that comes out because the kid missed the pass and is like, and then blames it on the actual kid's coach or the one that wants to run onto the field. We need to remember what stage of motor development they're in right now. And when you're dealing with kids that are in rec sports, you need to focus on having fun and just overall learning the game instead of trying to become a professional at the age of eight. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what you're saying is really, you know, it's really important. And I, I know that you, some of you heard my wife speak in the hour before, and I'm sure she told stories on me and I can tell a couple on her. Um, she doesn't have the patience to work with just kids who just want to learn tennis. She 
expects people to improve, puts a lot of pressure on them and that kind of stuff. And so she works well with pros. My kids would tell you that I don't have the patience either. Uh, my, the, I mentioned the son who was a soccer player. I knew nothing about soccer because we didn't play that when I was growing up. But I knew if my son was running faster than the other kid and getting up the field, I didn't know about offsides and those kinds of things, but I was one of those parents on the side yelling, get up there, get up there. And he's looking over at me and he says, I can, I'll be offsides. Um, so there, you know, there are aspects of us and our personalities that help determine who we work well with and who we don't. Uh, and it's really important, I think, to be aware of it and to examine some of the situations and roles that we found ourselves in. Dave, you're leaning forward like you've got something to say. Are you there? Yeah, my dog wanted a little loving. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Those are the nonverbals. <laughs> All right. Excuse me. Can I add in something really quick? Absolutely. I think from a coaching standpoint, I'm a uh, college basketball coach, but I also have a daughter that plays sports also. And one of the things I just tried to tell her early on when you're playing rec leagues is that you're doing this for skill, you're doing this for learning principles, things that you should – things that you want to do when you get older. And I would just put her, put her out there trying to decide if she wanted to play. And sometimes you have parents that go overboard and start screaming and hollering, and that's okay too. But I think early on is trying to figure out what are they good at, do they really want to play, how, how, how are they going to interact with the other kids out there that's playing also. Yeah, I, I think all that's important and, that, and, and you know, you, you're making a really good point. And the point that I'm trying to make with that is that it's easier for some parents to adopt that attitude as, with their kid as they go out there than it is for others. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, it wasn't all that easy for me, which is why I turned that early coaching over to somebody else uh, who, who was going to do what you're talking about and let them do that. What, what about, does gender affect how you coach? Somebody's gender? I mean, oh, excuse me. I coached girls and boys, so it really did, didn't really bother me. So I just coached basically the kids the same way a little bit, knowing that boys probably were really early on, probably was really aggressive early on, and girls wasn't like, like that. But as they got older, I just continued to coach them all pretty much the same. Does somebody else want to comment on that? Because what you just said, uh, I had the, the women's Olympic rowing coach say to me, uh, she actually was coaching both men and women. And one of the points that she made had to do with goal setting. And what she said was that with the guys, they all thought that they could walk on water and that she had to get them to set more realistic goals because they were, as you said, aggressive. They, they were going for it, and the goals that they were setting for themselves weren't always the most realistic. And for the women, she had to get them to extend themselves because they, they were, were not being as aggressive as she felt they needed to be to achieve the level. So she perceived a real difference as a function of gender. Are there any other differences or do you, things you disagree with relative to that? Um, oh, you know, does it make a difference being a male coach with a female athlete? Um, hi. Um, I don't know if you can see me. Um, Are you Sh Shamima? Shamima, here I am. Hi, oh, everyone. Hi. Um, so it's interesting. I was, I've been working in a female football soccer environment in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, we look into the research uh, in terms of gender differences oh, yeah. and in terms of the way that our coaches, are, our S&C people, um, our S&C coaches, our physios and that work with um, the women and there are some, some obvious, um, there are some differences in the way, in, in terms of the body development, in terms of how we train them on pitch. Um, and in terms of the communication part, um, we also notice, and I think this goes back to some of the research where I think there's some research on how uh, females tend and befriend, we call it. 
Um, and I think Joan Steininger, Steininger has highlighted this in her book as well. It's called Sisterhood in Sport, um, where we find that the women um, tend to communicate through their words verbally more, often, more so. Um, they like to discuss things and have a, um, a conversation about it uh, in, in their instruction. Whereas when I've been uh, in, in certain male environments, um, it's, it's very much more instructive and they take direction and they go on and, and, and very cognitive, they, they get on with the task. So um, that's what I've noticed, but I just wanted to bring in some of those aspects. Can, can I ask for a clarification maybe? Um, when you say women want to discuss it. Yeah, um, Ver verbally. It, and is the difference that they want to discuss not just the technical aspects of it, but the emotional aspects of it as well? Because you said the guys would listen and then they just go out and do whatever it was. Is that part of what you're talking about? I'm yeah, the emotional connection. Uh, sorry, I didn't make that clear. Correct. Okay. Uh, and I and I and I um, I know that there is um, it is born out of the the sort of some of the research points towards uh, the the neurophysiological responses. Um, and the neurotransmitters that are released in, in terms of that bonding and those relationships that you form um, through your tend and befriend uh, approach and those relationships that you build that ties in with, with those emotions as well. Okay. Any other things that any of you have noticed? Or any other, any other? I feel like sometimes with the younger, I've noticed like girls will trust implicitly first so they'll kind of see you as a specialist and allow you to be allow you to coach them where boys you have to earn their trust so they kind of don't trust you at first they kind of question you they kind of challenge you and so it's like a different like bonding relationship that way okay that's interesting uh, other observations or thoughts this is where we can get ourselves in trouble here as we we, we talk about these kinds of things but i think they're important to talk about um, because there, you know, I, I believe there are things that, that affect our relationships and who we work well with and, and who we don't. Um, any other thoughts related to, to gender? I had a, uh, I work at a high school, I'm a counselor, and I had our athletic director told me when he was coaching um, yeah. his daughters younger, um, that an older gentleman had told him that the difference between boys and girls, maybe at, at certain broad uh, broad brush strokes. Boys have to feel, have to play well to feel well. Girls have to feel well to play well. Thoughts on that? Sounds pretty reasonable to me. What about the rest of you? What do, we, what do you, what do you think? I, I'll tell you a, a, I'll tell you a story and, and uh, uh, you tell me if, uh, what you think about this, but with my wife on the professional tennis tour, I had the opportunity to be at a lot of tournaments and to travel and to, you know, to get to know a lot of the tennis players. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do, I had developed a test. And what I wanted to do was to administer the, the test under a couple of conditions to try and do a little research to see if there, you know, there were certain things that affected play and so on. So I asked a bunch of the women on the professional tennis tour to take the test and answer the questions on the test as if they were mid-cycle in their menstrual cycle. And then I asked them to take it again um, just prior to or at the time of the onset of their menstrual cycle. And uh, one of the athletes that, that I asked to do that was Martina. Uh, and, and I'd asked her because I had seen, well, I, I, I had felt that I had seen evidence on the, on the tour of menstrual cycle having an impact on players, um, because you get hormonal changes and you're playing at such a level in terms of your perception, your perceptual abilities and those kinds of things that it doesn't take much to throw you off. And so to me, it just seemed like, you know, especially if you've got to play at your very best level, um, menstrual cycle could, could have an effect. 
And uh, so I asked, Mar Martina took it and sure enough, the test results came back and she was over feeling overloaded. She, uh, her confidence was affected by a uh, menstrual cycle. She didn't feel as confident. And she had found that she had to basically isolate herself, uh, which she would do uh, prior to those kinds of matches. She also would hope that she was playing a, a player that she was physically that much better than. So, you know, it wasn't going to, she wasn't playing Chrissy Everett at that point in time or whatever, but so it wasn't going to be that close a match. And she was counting on uh, her reputation and so on as winning her a few extra points. Um, but I, I remember walking out on the tennis court at Eastbourne uh, prior to Wimbledon and she was, uh, Roz and I were on one court and she was on the, the next court. And she looked over at me um, and she yelled, hey, Bob, look. And she pointed to her t-shirt and on the t-shirt it said more than a bitch. And she said, it's that time of the month. Uh, just letting me know that, you know, this is, this is how I'm feeling right now and, and this is where it goes. Now, I don't know if, if that's what the rest of you feel, but the, the issue for me is that we need to be sensitive to all of those kinds of things because they can affect performance. Any comments or thoughts relative to that? Please don't share this on YouTube. I will never survive. It sounds, Bob, like it goes full circle with your first question on the Zoom. Um, it's about a relationship, and she felt comfortable enough to be able to, <laughs> to tell you that. Well, and that was really one of the good things about it. Uh, and she felt comfortable telling anybody that. Um, she, she recognized who she was. She was comfortable in her own skin. And so she would tell her coach. And her coach would know, you know, okay, I'm not trying to fiddle with technique here. I'm not trying to do anything else. You tell me what you need now for me to hit with you in this match preparation. I'm going to keep my mouth shut and I'm not going to say anything because I know you don't have a lot of tolerance right now for distractions. You're trying to control things and you're, you know, it's easy for you to get overloaded. So give me the signal and I'll be quiet. I'm, I'm not going to overload you. Any other thoughts, comments? Okay, we'll go on. Hi, can I add something on that? Um, hi, I'm Leslie. I'm sorry, I'm driving and listening. That's why I'm not sharing. But um, I, I, so I'm a strength conditioning coach, and I've worked with high school athletes and college athletes, so lots of men and women. And um, I, it's huge on what you said on relationships, and I think it's huge on knowing your personality and knowing who you are and being consistent within both of those. But one difference I have noticed, um, and it depends developmentally, like if they are youth, if they are oh, that boom, high school or if they are college, but um, women or girls tend to um, chemistry, I, I work with team sports, basketball, football, um, stuff like that. Chemistry is huge for, for girls and I tend to see like if there's a click or if there's some fighting going on, you'll see that on the court or on the field and you have to really work with them on that. Um, if like guys, from what I've seen, if there's a fight or something or people don't like each other, they don't care on the court. Like they'll just perform and they'll just do everything. But that's one thing I've noticed. I don't know if it's for everyone, but I've noticed with the teams that I've worked with. Okay, great. Uh, we're, we're getting uh, a little short on time here. So let me ask one last question. Let me get to this. When, um, when I was asked to uh, work with the Olympic track and field team, uh, I thought I knew what they wanted me to be doing. I, I thought I had a clear role definition. Um, and my notion of that, de of that was basically, look, you're there in a supportive role uh, and for crisis intervention. Uh, if an athlete says they're struggling with sleep and you can help them with sleep, okay, you know, make a tape for them, do something like that. If somebody is feeling suicidal or enters in a panic state for whatever reason, you know, maybe you can use some crisis intervention techniques to deal with them. Um, and I, I thought I had a pretty clear role definition. But what, I, what I came to find out was that, that the head of the TAC had a very different role in mind for me and who, who this 
the sports psychologists were working with the team. Uh, we were sitting at uh, lunch and um, what, he, what he said to me was that the reason that they had decided that they wanted sports psychologists was because they wanted the athletes to give up steroids and they thought that I might be able to provide them with mental skills that would offset uh, the effects of the steroids. Um, and when I in, told him that there wasn't any way that I understood that what went on in somebody's brain was going to suddenly add 40 pounds of muscle to their frame, uh, it wasn't likely that the athletes were going to be giving up steroids, but we had very, very different understandings of what they expected. And if that was what they expected, then as far as they were concerned, the introduction of sports psychologists to the Olympics in that situation was wasted because we did not affect uh, the use of steroids. But what I'm asking you that is, you know, how many of you found yourself in conflicting situations or unrealistic situations where you've got multiple expect expectations? Maybe the athletes that you're working with have one expectation, their coaches have another one. How many of you found yourselves in situations where you've had to manage those conflicting interpretations or in, uh, and how did you do it? Anybody? This is where we're ending. Okay, guys, that's <laughs> we're 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 out of time. I have something. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to put the video on here. Uh, when I was uh, a whitewater paddler, um, I had a coach that actually. Uh, uh, it was, it's, it's still kind of difficult to say. He basically, uh, he was a very good coach and, and he was, we we're getting pretty tight and he basically uh, pro proposed to me that if we were a couple that he'd be able to coach me better. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so there can be all sorts of uh, blurring of lines and uh, I, I learned that when I was 18 years old at the time that it was... <laughs> that there were some things that it wasn't that uh, I would not do and that I that were you know but it was in incredible that someone in a coaching capacity could abuse that you know that coach uh, athlete privilege really I thought so well, anyway. that's one of the you know we, we started out this this whole conversation with how personal are the relationships that we develop and how do we maintain boundaries because we do find ourselves, you know, as a relationship develops with somebody, uh, you want to please them. And, you know, that helps, you know, motivate and, and all of that kind of thing. And it's, it's really easy, really seductive to find those relationships and, and to begin to blur those boundaries. That's a, that's a very difficult thing, and it happens far more than we are willing to admit. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I mean that's that's something to think about. I've I've seen it where I've been asked to um, help an athlete get rid of negative thoughts mm -hmm. as she's in the middle of uh, it happened to be a discus thrower, and um, what was happening was that her coach uh, had gotten involved in a in a personal relationship with her. And um, the coach uh, paid attention to any attractive female. And so what was happening was she was upset uh, and thinking more about the fact that here she is bulking up, not looking like this good looking little woman that the coach is interested in and not her. And so she's got all of these negative thoughts and I'm being asked to help get rid of those negative thoughts so that she can perform. I mean, you, you, there are some really difficult situations that you can find yourself getting in. Any other thoughts, questions? Uh, well, I really appreciate How did you help in that relationship then? Like without like kind of walking away from it where it's like you're not doing the role that they expect, like 
how did you manage that? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, not well. Um, I mean, basically, I, I sat down and I tried to talk to her. Um, and I tried to talk to the coach. Uh, they understood the relationship. They weren't going to change the, their relationship. Um, today, uh, well, well, let me, let me go back. She was an adult. He was an adult. Um, so it's not, you know, it would be different if I'm working, I, I think with say the, you know, women on the gymnastics team who may be 15, 14, 16 years old. These are two adults, two consenting adults involved in a relationship. Um, and so I'm trying to give her suggestions of things to pay attention to, to so that she won't um, be thinking about him. Uh, so in a very simple way, what, what, uh, what we did was, uh, and this also will give you an idea of the limitations, she's a discus thrower. So I thought, well, okay, you know, one of the things I'll do is we'll work on having her take a deep breath, just, before, you know, work on her preparation to the point of time of initiating the throw. And then as she enters into the ring and starts to initiate the throw, I want her to pay attention to a quote process cue. So basically what I'm trying to do is just to get her to stay focused on this for only the length of time that it takes for her to go through and do the throw. Um, and so I tell her, well, okay, what, you're going to be standing there, so why don't you pay attention to the feeling of the weight of the discus in your, in your hand and your fingers as you're, as you're holding it. And then as you get ready, you enter in and you make your throw. Well, because I'm not a discus thrower and because I don't know technique, I turned to the coach and I asked the, I told the coach what I was going to try and do is just get her to attend to this process cue. And he pointed out to me, he said, okay, well, you know, that's a good idea, but don't have her pay attention to her arm and the weight of the discus in the arm because that may cause her to raise up and the discus relies, she's got to get low in the ring and be explosive and paying too much of attention to her hand can keep her from dropping down the way she needs to. So there should be another cue that you would be using. So basically the lesson I learned from, I didn't learn any lesson about how do I deal with this issue that they've got, they've got to work through that issue and they need a counselor to do that, which I did make a recommendation for, you know, a clinician who's going to deal with that relationship. But then with respect to the technical cue, I needed to go to the expert, which was this guy at that point, to find out what was a good process cue for her to be paying attention to. So that's it. That's okay. the answer. So if you did that, if you gave yourself advice for that going back, like, is it just like, hey, go see counseling and try to work more with the coach? Or what would you do differently in retrospect? Or is that it? Um, the, there wasn't a lot for me to do because this was within the confines of the limited access that I had to athletes and coaches as I was working with the elite development uh, throwers and, and uh, that kind of thing. So it wasn't like I was there for an ongoing relationship. Uh, I, I didn't do anything else. They, they had to work through their relationship and, uh, and I don't know if they did or not. Other thoughts? All right, well, thank you for being involved. I appreciate it and um, enjoy the rest of your day.